excited to be able to go back to my roots and recognize some of these compounds in the discussions. And it really has served me pretty well. So hopefully I can communicate on a good chemical and legal level to you today. Okay, synthetic psychoactive substances is kind of the overall term of art that I've used to describe these designer drugs, synthetic drugs, synthetic marijuana, bath salts, everything. That's the heading that I've just given it, but again, it's just a term of art and something that we can all use to reference the category of chemicals and drugs as a whole. Um, this first slide focuses on potpourri and incense. Uh, this compound is usually a plant material that's been laced with some type of synthetic cannabinoid. Um, generally, these are sold as herbal or organic substances, and they're designed to mimic the effects of marijuana. Most of these substances are labeled not for human consumption, but that it usually is simply to mask the intended purpose and avoid FDA regulation of the substance. Um, these substances generally go by a wide variety of trade names, including things such as K2, Spice, Earth, Impact, Mr. Smiley, Mr. Nice Guy, Eclipse. The list goes on and on and on. And one of the most common things that I found in my research is that if one is determined to be illegal, they simply label it as something else, slap that not for human consumption label on it, and they're done. So the list of trade names has grown exponentially. Um, usually they can be a mix of innocent enough botanicals. They'll throw a couple fancy little plant things into the list. Uh, but that trace amount of the synthetic cannabinoid is what gives it its marijuana-like uh, qualities. Generally, these are considered more dangerous than the natural marijuana drug uh, because that active ingredient that those plant materials are laced with actually binds more strongly to the cannabis receptors in the brain. Uh, for young people, the drug can pose even more serious risk because the adolescent brain is still developing um, and then continues to do so through the teen years and likely even a little bit beyond. So the development of an addiction to that substance or having a strong physiological response is much greater. This next slide um, is put together for bath salts. And I feel like it's important to make the distinction between the synthetic marijuana type drugs and then bath salts. Uh, synthetic marijuana drugs, because they're plant material laced with a the chemical, they're usually smoked or inhaled. Um, but these bath salts are actually the chemical compound itself, either in salt or crystalline form. Uh, they're man-made chemicals, and they are usually directly swallowed injected, like mixed with a liquid, and then injected directly into the bloodstream, or they're snorted. Um, these chemicals are designed to mimic the effects of MDMA, amphetamines, and cocaine. Reportedly, large bulk of bath salts are manufactured in China. Um, they're sold under usually general household use things, like insect killer or cleaner, uh, to try and avoid the regulation when they're actually imported into the U.S. Um, and they are labeled not for human consumption. Generally on the little package there is a label that says not for human consumption. But again, that's to mask the intended purpose and to avoid the FDA oversight and regulation. Um, these are similar to the cathinone compounds found in the cotton plant of Eastern Africa. That's where the their drug effect that they're trying to mimic was originally from a plant, a naturally occurring plant. Uh, and again, just like the synthetic marijuana compounds, the trade names for these substances go on and on and on. Uh, usually it kind of plays off the crystalline form, the white powder, so you're going to run across things like bliss, ocean, ivory, uh, lust, magic, white dove, white lightning, um, but there's many, many more in that list. Also, it's important to note, because this is an actual chemical compound that's directly 
ingested or injected or snorted, uh, the, the pure, purity of that substance becomes at, at issue. And unfortunately, with this substance, the manufacturing process is just not that pure. Um, you run into a lot of dirty laboratories, um, and that potential for contamination is really high. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, it takes a very, 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 very small amount of contamination to bring about very unwanted and undesired effects in the actual chemical itself. Um, so sometimes, especially in regards to bath salts, if a contaminant ends up in the chemical itself or in the substance itself, it can actually have more uh, detrimental effects uh, to the person who ingests it than maybe even the compound would by itself if it was actually pure. May I interject a question? Are you yeah, talking sure. about chemical contamination or are we talking about bacterial or potential? I'm chemical? sure it's both. <laughs> because in drug addicts, one of the problems we have is people who shoot up, their works get contaminated, right. they get fungus, and they get, I see them when they get fungal infection and bacterial function to the eye. Right. But we've recently had that, the problem with the lab who was contaminated and people were getting their spines injected. And right, and I am sure there's a level of contamination on both fronts. Um, and that's one of the reasons that when people ask me, I, I think the bath salts is even more of a risk because you know, they're not manufacturing it in a lab with gloves and goggles and full-on safety gear. The work surface is not clean, and all of those things can add up to have a really awful effect when you get the actual product. What are, what are the actual chemicals in the bath salts? What are the actual chemicals? Uh, we'll get to that. Yes, that? we'll get to that for sure. And actually, that's the other document that I provided for you today, um, or just this kind of gets into the legal side because this is the listing of what's been prohibited under state and federal law, but they have to list them by chemical name. So chemists, doctors, nurses probably could recognize some of the chemical structures that are listed there. Um, so going into health risks, like I said before, almost all of these products, if not all of them, have a little sticky label on them that says not for human consumption. But usually that is it. Um, so they are very poorly labeled as to the contents of the actual substance. Um, and I have here different causes have different effects. It's important to distinguish because the drugs are targeting two different types of responses, they actually have different effects to the body in, in regards to the health risks that individuals face. Um, these are typically marketed as a legal high. Um, they don't usually show up on clinical drug tests. There are a few tests out there now to test for the more common synthetic compounds. But in general, if you do a blanket clinical drug test, you're not going to catch a lot of these synthetic drugs. Um, as far as synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic marijuana, some of the responses that you can see I've listed up here for you. Um, mild responses include increased agitation, vomiting, and extreme nervousness. The more violent responses include psychosis, heart attacks, elevated blood pressure, tremors, and seizures. Um, but a lot of the reports that I found have indicated that long-term effects, or even a lot of the compounds that are now listed, uh, they have been untested in humans. Um, so a lot of the physiological responses are a big question mark in regards to synthetic marijuana. As far as bath salts go, Again, it's probably going to depend on what chemical you actually ingest. But some of the mild response health risks um, include headache, heart palpitations, and nausea. And some of the more violent <coughs> ones are similar to what you would see on methamphetamines or cocaine. And they include hallucinations, paranoia, heart attack, kidney failure, increased tolerance for pain, and suicide. Uh, there's also a few studies out there that indicate documented users um, can have a history of mental illness um, when it's over a long period of time. So, these compounds were first discovered and used in Europe. Uh, once it was found out in Europe that a lot of the substances didn't show up on drug tests, uh, the popularity really took off. It wasn't until 2008 that the compounds started um, being detected here in the U.S. Um, DEA uh, synthetic cannabinoids in incense products were first detected in the U.S. in November of 2008 um, by 
by the DEA's forensic lab. And that was because it was uh, reportedly being encountered by US Customs and Border Protection. So a lot of substance was coming in. US Customs and Border Protection was had no idea what the substance was. And so they did a large phase study to try and determine exactly what chemical compounds they were looking at. Um, and that didn't occur until 2008. So this is a very recent problem in the United States. Um, I put up two uh, graphs here. Uh, these are based on national statistics from the poison uh, control centers. Uh, according to the American Association of Poison Control Centers, 2,906 calls relating to human exposure to synthetic marijuana were received in 2010. So that's the blue graph. Um, and then it's comparing it to the numbers that were received in 2011. Um, twice that number was actually reported in 2011 at 6,959 calls. Um, I recently got on and tried to get the numbers for 2012, and it was reported 5,200 exposures were reported for 2012, which is actually a drop from what they saw in 2011. Um, I haven't seen any research how broad or how narrow those calls were. Um, the poison control centers are just titling them exposures at this point. Um, so according to the same center, but in regards to bath salts, the numbers are a little bit uh, more drastic. Uh, in 2010, uh, the number of calls to poison control centers was 304. Um, in 2011, it jumped by more, more than 20 times at, to get to the number of 6,138. Now, the exposures that were reported for 2012 actually showed a significant drop in the calls related to bath salts at only 2,654 uh, for 2012. I have no research at this time why that drop occurred. Um, and at least for bath salts, it seems that there is some correlation to the summer months. Um, there seems to be a higher rate of usage between June, July, and August <coughs> than in the winter months. Uh, and again, I'm not really sure why that number has dropped off in recent years, uh, but I'm sure there will be some more studies in progress to try and see if the problem increased or, or really decreasing or if that was just a difference in the year, you know. Um, and I want to stress that these are national numbers. These are not for our local area. These are not even for Texas. This is the national system of the number of calls that were reported. Was there an age distribution or a more common? Uh, they found, and I don't have that document with me. If you want, I can provide it to you, Dr. Carr, and you can disseminate it across your board. But they, both of them typically have a more young, younger age bracket. Um, the variation I saw was in between about 17 and 25. Um, but again, that's kind of just what they've pegged is most of the calls with this age bracket. So, and they are slightly different for bath salts versus synthetic marijuana. Uh, it's kind of the interesting thing about having two separate compounds is there usually is a little bit of overlap there right in the middle, but one tends to be a younger drug and one tends to be an older drug. And I think, if I'm remembering correctly, um, the synthetic marijuana is the one that tends to be a little bit younger. But I'll provide you with that information for sure. Okay, so moving on to some of the current laws that are on the books right now. Um, and I have to stress that I put these in order of federal, state, and local. Um, so pay attention to the dates that these were passed. Uh, notoriously, federal government is a little bit slower to respond to issues than some of the states maybe. And usually federal legislation is enacted to kind of take a more holistic approach to what the states have been doing already. So as you can see from this slide, as far as federal regulation in this area goes, uh, we're looking at very recent legislation. Uh, July 9, 2012 is when President Obama finally signed over the law, Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act of 2012. Uh, this added some synthetic cannabinoids to the Schedule One list of controlled substance, or the Controlled Substances Act. Um, that handout that I provided to you, um, I put the state ones first because the state list is more expansive for Texas, but the federal uh, compounds are actually listed towards the back of the, the list I provided to you. So you can actually see exactly what, these are the compounds that the federal government has listed as illegal. So under the state of Texas, and I'll point out to you, this was enacted or passed in 2011. Uh, the Texas Controlled Substances Act 
was amended by House Bill 2118 and Senate Bill 331. And each one kind of took a different approach, which I think is very convenient because it made it very easy to pull up the list and add them to. Because one focused on the more synthetic marijuana drugs and one focused on the drugs, uh, the basalt type drugs. Um, and you can see there uh, <coughs> that these were all added to the Health and Safety Code Chapter 481 and are now listed at, under the Texas Controlled Substances Act as illegal drugs. Um, along these same lines, um, those compounds are listed in the handout I gave you as well. Uh, they can't, you run into problems with a lot of the direct laws because they can't say we're going to ban anything that causes this physiological response. And so the way that they have developed to regulate drugs and other illegal substances is to regulate the actual compound in the drug that causes that response that we're trying to regulate. And so you end up with almost any category <coughs> of illicit substances, a long list of chemical structures. I've pulled out for you simply the synthetic ones. Um, there are many, many more sections in chapter 481 that cover other drugs that are also uh, illegal under state law. And the list of chemicals is pretty expansive. So other laws that have been put on the books, as you can see here, almost uh, at least 70 Texas municipalities have adopted local ordinances banning synthetic psychoactive substances. Uh, none of these ordinances include every synthetic compound that is prohibited under federal or state law. And mostly, that is mostly in response to the fact that these local ordinances were enacted before federal or state law was enacted. So you see a lot of them coming into existence in 2010, 2011 in an attempt to try and curb some of, I'm guessing, what were occurring within those local communities. So they were seeing a higher rate of this drug, we're gonna regulate it, and then the state and federal government <coughs> stepped in and also regulated it. So you're, you just don't run across many municipalities that have a complete list. Um, and I think, again, that's because they were enacted before the complete list was even put into state law. Um, and just, you know, to throw it out there, the city of Lubbock is currently considering this type of option, um, looking at banning a list of substances within, but that's in the works, and that's going to be a policy decision made by city council. So lastly, I really wanted to cover this section with you. Um, the city council, the city of Lubbock has charged the Board of Health to explore and recommend ways of educating the public on these synthetic psychoactive drugs. Um, there is a huge public misconception regarding these substances. Um, and this is kind of just my brief list on, obviously it's a lot more in depth than that, that the public needs to know that these substances are not safe, they're not all the same, they're not organic and they're not herbal, and they're not legal. I mean, if you go through that entire list, I am sure the manufacturers can stay ahead of the curve somewhat, but anybody that's out in the stream of commerce knows that it takes a while for all of the previous compounds to be used up and the new ones to get put in place. Um, the City of Lubbock uh, Legal Department is currently exploring other regulatory options. Uh, your efforts to explore the educational components of this issue can really help us in our efforts as well. Um, information gathering is extremely important to uncover the myths, uh, expose the reality of the problem, and determine the lasting effects that these substances do or can have in the city of Lubbock. Uh, we've been fortunate um, as of right now uh, to have had several meetings with the Board of Health Subcommittee um, set up to discuss this topic. Uh, and the work that you guys are doing uh, can, further, um, can further the effectiveness of the project as a whole for the city of Lubbock. So I want to thank you, especially for appointing the subcommittee, because I know that their uh, their assistance on our side and the information sharing that's going on has definitely helped us do a great job. And it's all part of the same process. And we're here as a resource to you as well. If you have questions or something that we can assist you with, we're 
more than happy to do so. So thank you for allowing me the chance to speak with you. And if you have any questions, any other questions that have come up. Yes, sir, thank you for a great presentation. I have, I have uh, actually three questions. Okay. So I'll address one at a time. I'll try uh, to on your last slide, you mentioned it's not organic. Organic has gotten a, a different usage because people think of organic as something that's raised on a farm without right. artificial fertilizer. Right. But as you as a chemist know, this is a, all, they can call it organic. It's organic chemistry. It's organic chemistry. It's organic chemistry. So it is organic. It's not natural. It's not natural. Natural might be a better word to uh, to put in there because sure. it is organic. And that's part of the education process. It's like making the distinction. It's like yes. they are, it's they are calling it this organic because they can under the chemical designation, but it's not what you're picturing. <laughs> People think of produce at Whole Foods right. or at, uh, at Market Street. Right. And that's what they're that's what they're equating it to. Well, and I have to say, when I gave this presentation to um, a, a similar presentation to another local association, uh, I when I read, you know, the the interesting facts about synthetic marijuana kind of thing, I actually had the picture when I actually I'll go back to it. When I saw the picture in the bottom right, I was like, are you kidding? That looks like somebody went out into one of our vacant lots, stripped the weeds, and then put it in a 55-gallon drum full of a chemical. Yeah. And I'm going, there's no way I'm thinking that's organic. But that's not the picture they're getting. They're getting the little itty-bitty pretty package of material with shiny colors <coughs> and flashing lights. And somebody at the counter is saying, yeah, it's organic. It's a bunch of plants. <laughs> what kind of plants? Uh, so, yes, I'm right there with you. So I think it's a misconception, and part of the education process is to con <coughs> correct that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, this stuff can come from uh, human feces fertilized fields in China, and that's organic, too. Uh, another question, one of the things that I'm still confused on, why can federal and state not ban entire classes of chemicals? You've got listings of chemicals. One can, can, it's infinite, the number of changes, minor changes, that one can make the surface of oh, a yeah. chemical. Oh, yeah. Why can we not ban entire classes of psychoactive drugs? Well, and I think they've tried to do it a little bit. You can see in the handout that I gave you, most of the listing of compounds <coughs> are preceded by, we're going to regulate this type of chemical structure that has this type of addendum to the molecule. And it includes such chemicals as, and then it gives a whole long list. So they're trying not to limit it to just a big long list. And I think the concern comes is they don't want to go throw that net too far. Because um, labs still need to operate, and doctors still need to be able to treat patients, and chemical laboratories still need to research new drugs. And so, you know, there may be potentially one of these drugs out there that could have beneficial effects. And so I think that's part of the process is they're trying to find the exact depth and width <laughs> to regulate but without over-regulating the But it area. comes down to usage. You can have a banned chemical, and you may find that that banned chemical is useful. Mm -hmm. So you, in the FDA or other process, you make ex yeah. exclusion. You call yeah. it an orphan drug or whatever. And it seemed better to be able to exclude for usage and Certain more things. inclusive and then it comes back to a proof issue. I think after you get over that hurdle, it then becomes a proof issue. If someone comes into the office exhibiting some type of physiological response, it then becomes, well, what caused that response? And was that in response to you know, a legal usage or an to legal usage? Because they'll say it was a legal usage all day long. And so then how do you prove in court that that <coughs> usage was actually illegal? And so now we have a list of substances that are illegal, so any use of those substances is illegal. But again, I think it's a process. And as the, the governments kind of take a closer look at it and work through it, they may find other ways to regulate it that are more effective. But that's entirely part of the process, and it's only been four years since they really started looking at it in the <coughs> United States. One other question that okay. ties in with recent uh, uh, shootings at Sandy Hook, Colorado, and so forth. Uh, there's been reports that each of these shooters has been on some type of psychotropic drug. We've seen an increase since 2007, 2008, which ties in with, with this. 
Is there any indication that any of these designer drugs were, were used, particularly in this last Sandy Hook, because there were some news reports, I think, MSNBC had just a very brief thing on where they where they mentioned this type of drug. I haven't read any reports on it, um, and it, we may never know. I do know that there has been an increase in, uh, like, DWIs, uh, where it's been mm-hmm. traced back to, like, a, a legal marijuana or something. Yes, Good. illegal. Alcohol consumption in addition to this? No, 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 like, it's a, a they're exhibiting a physiological response that is similar to Got what it. alcohol would produce, but it turns out it's not alcohol. It's something else, and the response that the individual is giving, well, all I did was smoke legal weed. Um, and I think that ties back to the educational component is, okay, you, you do what you think is legal weed, and this is going to be the response. <coughs> it's not, I mean, you're going to total your car and maybe hurt somebody else and yourself in the process. Can they be legally charged for driving under the influence of these drugs? Uh, It depends. Uh, There'll be a whole, I'm sure, it just depends on how the case is brought in court. Um, Because usually there's a a driving under the influence. We don't know what that influence was, but there is some kind of chemical influence that caused you to operate your vehicle in an unsafe or reckless manner. Uh, but again, it's going to come down to what, ab- what are they able to prove under the statute and then what actually happened, which is a very fact-specific discussion, and I'm just not aware of are that. Are people being checked, such as this driver who was driving 90 miles an hour down Glen Good Acre and killed a young college student? Are those people, are their bloods checked for the, these type of drugs in addition to alcohol and other? They're not. No. Not at this time. Not that I'm aware of. It's very difficult. It's very it's expensive. Done down in Houston what? and... It's a mess. Yeah. It's a very expensive process. It's a <coughs> wide panel base, and you have to have the standards available. Because yeah. that could be supplementary in many of the <coughs> problems. You know, and that may, that may be coming if they continue to see an issue. That may be coming. I don't know. I can't speak to how the legislature is going to look at that. Mm-hmm. Dr. All Epstein? those are yeah. kind of issues that are taking place. And thank you for a very fine presentation. Um, you mentioned, I recognize that your uh, department is working with the city in an attempt to look at potentially drafting ordinances regarding banning some of these substances, and yet we have extensive state and federal laws which already ban substances. Are there any additional substances that are not already covered by state or federal regulation there that you're going few. to recommend? Yeah, that we there is a few. I didn't put them on the slide because there really is a list of about five or six. Um, but when we were in the process of drafting, I actually looked at the 70 different municipal laws out there, and I tried to create the most expansive list possible. And I think it's just, you know, to, to try and be as inclusive as possible um, in prohibiting those substances. But again, that's going to be a decision for the policymakers, and we have tried to incorporate everything that we could under different laws. Um, in order to make that ordinance as a whole the best it can be. Do, uh, let me ask a follow-up sure. question. Uh, does the, will the state list of banned substances continue to be updated as state regulators look at this? I would assume yes, because that they are constantly in the process of updating that list. Um, and it really it becomes how fast can they stay ahead of the manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And we all know that the legislative <coughs> process is not one that happens overnight. And so as soon as a bill is filed, I'm sure somebody is out there trying to create a new substance that's not going to be on the list. Okay. Or just label it as something else and not worry about it. Because that, I'm sure, happens as well. Dr. Preston? <laughs> kind of along those lines that I am, um, apparently, or it appears to me, the committee may have a, or something may have a bit of better report, but or a better idea, but banning individual substances or chemicals, novel classes, even, you know, if, if everything that could be thought of was banned, I'm not sure it would be enforceable still um, because they're going to change it so quickly. But has anybody looked at putting a, uh, almost like denaturing ethanol, where you put a very rapid acting purgative or laxative in those compounds for not for human consumption. <coughs> it's just like alcohol, that's how they control ethanol consumption. I haven't heard of anything like 
that's, and I think really in, in regards to kind of the first part of your question, that's why this process is so important that uh, legal department along with city council, along with board of health, and that there is a component of information gathering that is very, very crucial. Because um, we, we want to do the best job we can, and as part of that, we've got to have the information, you know, who, who is doing this? Do we have a problem in our local community? Um, what do the numbers look like in our local community? Um, what are the ways that we can effectively regulate it in the community to see <coughs> a decrease in those numbers? And I think options like that, I mean, and I'm sure there's countless others, but that's the only way that we can actually discover those is through this type of discussion and this type of information sharing um, between the Board of Health, the legal department, the city council, so that we adopt a more holistic approach to solving the problem. Steve, I like your idea. You need to take this to higher level. Go for the state legislature. I think, you know, and along those lines, does anybody buy this stuff or anything else? I don't know. It's a good question. Does anybody really burn it for incense or faith in it? It's a good question, and that's what we're hoping to find out. Could I just just interject here? <coughs> we're investigating all this with the legal department. They've asked us to hold back on publicizing all this until something is formulated. Oh, okay. But if you have ideas, we're always interested in hearing your ideas. But uh, <coughs> rather not do that in a public forum at this time. <laughs> That's, that's all right. Any well, other any other questions? Or I just wanted to add something to, to Laura, what Laura said. I appreciate you agreeing to come and talk to us today. Um, <coughs> along with uh, Don's uh, next to last question, where he was discussing the broad covering the broad spectrum of of sort of a class of drugs. Um, just to add to your answer, which, which is a very good answer, but uh, as a scientist, I can tell you that I would shudder if they have laws banning broad classes because then companies like that I get my chemicals from right. would not be allowed to sell those and so from a scientific standpoint you couldn't do any research on these things to see what the heck they do do and this is a problem we run into all the time where Sigma Chemical for instance is a, is a main supplier of, of biological chemicals for research and they just have to stop selling them and then you have a severe problem and, and getting you either have to synthesize them yourself which is time consuming and difficult or you just have to say I'm not going to do that kind of research and so people mm -hmm. don't look at it so it's, it's a it's a real from a scientific standpoint it's, it's certainly difficult but as a researcher Ted can't you get around that by uh, you have simple like research exclusion you get sure the but they don't want to deal with that they because don't. all the paperwork and all the problems involved the suppliers just they just got but if, if Sigma's making huge amounts of cannabinoids, it's just a matter of... They moved, well, at one time Sigma was making LSD, but uh, they don't do any of that stuff. Hard to get now. Uh, right. They just don't want to get near it. Because there's all... Because then they can say someone could take this and get in the hands of someone else. And it's, it's sort of a logistic nightmare. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Appreciate it. Doctor, anything else on the subcommittee report? Yes. Um, well, as I said just a minute ago, we've we've met uh, two times now with the legal department. They've been very helpful, with, and we're working on different kinds of strategies. But uh, if individuals here have ideas, we're always welcome to, to hear those ideas. But at the moment, um, mm -hmm. that's all sort of we don't want to make that public. We also got to meet with city council members, and uh, Todd was one of the city council members that met with us. And they're very, of course, very attuned to this and very active, trying to keep abreast of what's happening. And one of the things that, for instance, Brian brought up <coughs> at one of our meetings was, of course, the need for uh, potentially an educator from the health department. And so we're, we're actively pursuing that, that aspect. Um, we have, of course, education is, is the main thing that that we will, we will attempt to push. And we want to meet with LISD, um, as I said, the, the need for the educator from the health department. Also, um, we have, we're planning different things, strategies, such as um, 
Chairman McKay wants to have us on television on the 30th to discuss this problem. Uh, also, we've met with people from SPARC, which is the South Plains Alcohol and Addiction Research Center, and they're very interested in helping us formulate ways to, to look at this, at this problem. <coughs> so, in a way, this is an ongoing discussion, and we're uh, actively trying to, to push this, this forward. So the committee is still working on it. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is that uh, uh, at our last meeting on Wednesday, uh, I'm currently working to collect local data oh, yeah. uh, with uh, Dovetree and MHMR and, and some other centers where, uh, because legal has told us that what they need is they need to have a, a empirical, ba empirical basis that you can start an argument from of is this a problem in the community? And I know in my own caseload, uh, I've got probably half a dozen uh, clients who have experimented with both of these drugs. And uh, I've been in conversation with some people at Dovetree who are also talking about what they're seeing. So I think we're hopefully, uh, I think we, we'd said the 31st or something. It's like the, the day before the city council's next meeting, we're going to meet and have some data that will not necessarily be, you know, hard numbers, but at least give us anecdotal kind of information about what we're seeing. So that's kind of the next step, I think, on that, even as we're still doing others. Yes, Doc. Uh, Brian, question. The anecdotal things that you're seeing and other people are seeing, are these synthetic drugs more uh, devastating to people than, say, just smoking marijuana or hashish or something that's natural? Yeah, the way I describe it is that, uh, it, in fact, at the meeting on Wednesday, I, I've listed I found dozens and dozens of Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was interesting was the, the common story is uh, somebody who would write, I'm kind of a party animal and I like smoking weed and I like drinking, but when I did this drug, don't do this drug. And so these are people who were seasoned in one sense with recreational drug use and this, these are drugs which they're saying, I don't like that, the, the, one of my clients that smoked uh, Spice uh, it turned him inside out for about three days. Uh, nausea, vomiting, dehydration. Uh, Dovetree was telling me about someone that was injecting bath salts that came in like a pot of mashed potatoes and it took him three weeks to get motor skills back and some other things. And so uh, the, these are drugs that as, as people use them, I find it intriguing that there's not many people that are advocating this as well, this is a good drug. They're saying, well, I tried it and I don't want to try it again. You don't, you shouldn't try it either. So I think that's what we'll, we'll find in the education that there's, there's not too many people who are advocates. Are we getting, you think we're getting longer binding time on the, on the, on the central nervous system? Well, since that's you don't fine. know what the drugs are, yeah, uh, depends on the drug but the behavioral yeah. output is, yes, it, there's something happening there and how longer much of it's term. biochemical. Longer, yeah. stronger. Yeah. So it's longer. binding, it's going on there as permanent or semi-permanent okay. compared to uh, the cannabinoid that one yeah. might just smoke. Yeah, just in and out. Plus there's a lot of impurities, we don't know what the heck they're doing. Okay, for the sake of time, uh, anything else that we have from subcommittee? No? Okay. Can, can I have, can I like sure. ask one question? So, and this is just out of curiosity. You know, salvia divinorum used to be the synthetic marijuana. Does mm -hmm. this current stuff in, involve the salvia? I haven't run into it, but I know that's one of the ones that's been listed on other municipal regulations uh, that is consideration for also being regulated along with these types of synthetics. Um, but again, that's a more naturally occurring substance. Yeah, so exactly. even it <laughs> would probably end up being, I don't know. I mean, it, it falls right alongside the same discussion. The, um, this JWH that you see here in all these compounds, those are the initials of a researcher at Emory that first started this research and came up with a couple of these compounds. And so you can see what has happened since then. They still use this same designation, but he didn't do all this, but other people are jumping into the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. and, and along those lines, I had <coughs> an email to be forwarded with that uh, scientist's name that's mm. coming in April. And some April. of his, he, he is the leading authority on these chemicals. Mm. And, um, I don't know if y'all saw it. Maybe we need to read it. I must have missed it. I must have missed it. Sorry. Anyway, he's coming in April to speak at the institute, and in April, oh good. But he, I communicated with him. He would be willing to come earlier to meet if anybody's interested in me pursuing that. I can do that. Right, please, good. please. I think we good. Be good.
Dr. Mack. Yeah, right, Brian, one other additional thought. One of the Kennedy sons, I believe mean it's Bob Kennedy's son, has come out very strongly against marijuana. And I'm thinking this might be a, a good thing to use nationally for, for education because the Kennedy name still has resonance mm -hmm. even with younger <coughs> people. Okay. And uh, just a thought of, of tying, some, I don't, we, we certainly can't tie him in personally here, but tying in people like that to, mm -hmm. to help educate, uh, whether it be on the synthetics or the natural products or whatever, to get get some help mm -hmm. out there. What do you, what do you think? What uh, do you yeah, think? I, well, I think that this is still so evolving and like what Dr. Reed's saying, um, we'll report back and there's there's some pretty significant stuff that we're not putting out there yet, but I think we, we can come up with a plan and recognize that really Lubbock's taking the lead on this, that yes. uh, there, there's nobody in front of us, and so we may be the ones that set the standard that kind of offer a protocol for others. Okay, anything else on this? Okay. One thing that we have to be careful of that will chase away any of the young people is not getting into the propaganda yeah. about these drugs and sticking to true education yeah. and getting them involved. And we have talked about r revising a youth panel <coughs> to help educate us. And I think that's one of our most effective ways. Yes. yes, okay. All right, seeing nothing else. Uh, for the sake of time, on 3.1 review of 2012 health goals, that's included in your packet. I just uh, I went back and revisited that from what we'd adopted back in January 2012, and so I'll leave that for your reading. We don't really have any any action on that. Just a sense of this is what we said we're going to do back in January. This is what we ended up doing. So I'll leave that for your reading, and if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it informally uh, or at the next meeting. But for the second time, I'd like to get on. Let's do the 3.2 report on hydraulic fracturing committee. Dr. Epstein. Hey, our committee continues to study scientific issues regarding to environmental concerns about fracking and potential mitigations. Uh, that is, things that we as a city could do that might reduce the risk associated with hydraulic fracturing operations. Um, I would like to thank Dr. May, who sent out a article from the New York Times as well as several other places um, under the <coughs> title, Gas Drilling is Called Safe in New York. Um, I would like to make a few comments about this. Um, this was a uh, leaked document which is considered out of date and which we do not have. The document, uh, the reports about what the document showed as well as the summary are a a summary of an ongoing study from the state of New York, um, which is their environmental, uh, their environmental department, regarding issues of fracking. And what the <coughs> report actually said, the, sum the summary of the report, which I have a summary of here, um, is extensively, uh, extensively addresses environmental concerns that our committee has looked at as well as mitigation measures, that is, measures that could ameliorate some of the environmental risks and make fracking safer. So um, actually, this report from the New York Department of Environmental Conservation very much supports the work that our subcommittee is doing, looking at environmental risks and efforts that mitigation or, and what factors that we could do to mitigate risks might do so that we can reduce any risks associated with fracking. So once again, I want to thank Dr. May for calling this to our attention and for the support that the New York State De uh, Department of Environmental Conservation is giving to the whole efforts to reduce risks associated with fracking. Okay, anything else to report? Anything else? No. Nope. Oh. All right. Okay. Communicable disease report. Mary. Um, it's been a very, December was a very quiet month for us. All the heart diseases were at or below the expected number. We had no reports of vaccine preventable or insect borne diseases. We did have 11 cases of invasive streptococcal disease. And they were all investigated in education and education. Okay. Wash your hands. Yeah. Wash your hands. Cover your cough. Lots of times. Don't touch your face. Get a blue shot. Cough into your sleeve. Right? Okay. 
Councilwoman Joy is here today to, for her personal testimony of. <laughs> she she lives lives and prospers, but was a little bit thin for a while. We certainly appreciate Council coming and attending our meetings. Okay, we need to approve the uh, December 21st, uh, 2012 meeting. Oh, yes. I have a question. May yes, on the influenza surveillance report. Yes. Now, on the influenza like illnesses, normally we don't report unless the flu screen is positive. How do you how do you get these cases reported to the health department? I'm a lot of those come from school nurses. From with school nurses. Oh, I see. With I see. absenteeism for influenza like illness. Clinically, influenza like, but the screen was negative. Or they are not tested. I see. Okay. Not tested. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. I ask for approval if you've had a chance to look at our December minutes. Do I have a motion? Approved. Second. Second. Dr. Reed. Okay. So those all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Those moments are approved. Any other matters before the board? We, we have a very active, a lot of things going on. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Reed and Dr. Epstein for doing it. We're meeting regularly with legal, uh, and uh, I think we're going to come up with some good plans. Any other uh, discussion, announcements, matter of business to appear before the board? Seeing none, then I will adjourn the meeting. See you in February. Man. Thank you very much. I got places to be. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. 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 Good to see you.